Okay, can you see a picture of Hillary right now? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, let me get going here then. <clears throat> so here's the one of the problems for beekeepers these days, and that's called the World Wide Web. Um, and uh, it used to be, if you wanted to learn about beekeeping, you either did what I did when I was young, which was apprentice to an experienced uh, beekeeper who was actually doing it for a business and learned the trade, or you would read the beekeeping books. The thing with the beekeeping books is they had to go through an editor who edited out uh, the advice in there. Nowadays, if you go on the internet, I did a little search for beekeeping on, uh, on Google and got 300, uh, 32 million uh, hits on that. Well, after reading the first million or two, I realized there's a lot of conflicting advice out there. So my suggestion to you is be careful um, with going to the internet for advice, because you're going to get a lot of uh, really strange advice out there. One of the reasons is, is this, this problem, which is called um, difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. We actually have a president of our country right now that is very much a, an example of, of, <laughs> of this happening. <laughs> um, and so I, I've taken this, uh, this curve right here uh, from uh, after Dunning and Kruger and applied it to beekeeping. It, where you start, this is your uh, years of beekeeping experience, starting off and maybe to the rest of one's life. Um, and then this is your self-assessment of your knowledge and ability. You start off with very little self-assessment. You get your first hive, put it in a box, maybe get some sugar syrup, builds up and makes some honey. And you go, wow, I have got to be the world's smartest beekeeper. I don't know what they're talking about because this was just so easy. And you start your blog on how you should be a beekeeper until the next year when all of your colonies die a ugly death from varroa and deforming the virus, or maybe of starvation or whatever they die from. And then at this point, one of two things happen. Either you give it up or you get back on the horse and you get on the slope of experience and enlightenment. Well, some people, this slope is pretty much flat. There are a number of people who are essentially first year beekeepers for 20 years in a row. They never learn a dang, dang thing. But most of us will slowly start to learn stuff. And one of the neat things about this, notice this slope never levels out. If you're uh, a beekeeper doing it for a long time, you will continue to learn until your last days right there. There's always new things to learn about uh, beekeeping. And I love that. I like this quote back from uh, 1920 uh, from England, the beekeeper, master of Warlow, Warlow. The bees have their definite plan for life, perfected through countless ages and nothing you can do will ever turn them from it. You can delay their work or you can even thwart it altogether but no one has ever succeeded in changing a single principle in bee life. And my take home from that was his final sentence is, and so the best bee master is always the one who most exactly obeys their orders from the hive. And that is what I do. I serve my bees. And the best beekeepers do that very thing. It's not about you or what you want. It's about making life as good as you can for your bees. And if you do that, then you can reap a profit from them. So we tend to do everything from a human perspective. I thought you might wanna look at the rules of beekeeping if the honeybee were to write those rules. So from their point of view, the first rule is they need a warm, dry cavity. Now the practical application of this for bee husbandry is pretty much any kind of dry box will do just fine. The bees don't care whether you have a, a British National or a Langstroth or a Top Bar Hive or a Skep. They don't give a, a wit about any of that stuff. They just need a warm, dry cavity. The second thing, they need food. And the two foods for bees are pollen and nectar. And there are times when due to dearth or due to weather, there's no available pollen or nectar to be had and the bees live off their stores. From a husbandry point of view, the beekeeper has the options of feeding an artificial nectar, which is sugar syrup or even a sugar patty or something, and feeding uh, artificial pollen, a pollen substitute, which here in dry California uh, uh, revolutionized my beekeeping here uh, because we have a very long dearth period. It's, it's not at all unusual where I live to go for five months without a single drop of rain during the summer. That's normal, five drops five months with no rain whatsoever. So we, we do have dearth out here. 
Um, and then the uh, next rule is bees need to manage their parasites. Now, all animals and plants have parasites. And generally, you strike a host parasite uh, balance. The honeybees have this novel parasite, uh, Varroa destructor, uh, to which they were not initially adapted. And it's really been tough for them. Um, I hear that some of you guys over there in, uh, in England uh, or the British Isles, uh, maybe Ireland, um, may be uh, uh, selecting our, uh, for stocks that are exhibiting signs of resistance. And that's something that I'm very much doing here in California. But in general, most beekeepers throughout the world still are um, keeping bees that are honeybees that are not resistant to, to the varroa mite. So <clears throat> if that's the stock they're keeping, then it's the responsibility of the beekeeper to help the bees dealing with this parasite. <clears throat> and that's the end of the rules from the beekeeper view. So real quick, they need a cavity, they need food, they need to deal with parasites. That's it. Any other rules you hear from anybody are a reflection of that person rather than something that the beekeeper, the bees themselves really care about. Now, you should be aware, <clears throat> there are what I call the four horsemen of bee apocalypse. The, three, the four things that can cause issues, health issues or, <coughs> or collapse of the hive. First thing, a honeybee is a tropical insect that has adapted by living in a warm cavity to living in uh, cold winter areas. Um, second is porn. <coughs> so chilling is always a factor for bees. If they chill, they, they don't do well. The second is uh, nutrition. Um, bees thrive when there's good nutrition, plenty of uh, natural nectar and pollen coming in. There are toxins. Now, most people nowadays say toxins. Oh, that's got to be man-made toxins. Well, there's, there's actually plenty of toxins out there. Here in California, we have two plants that are extremely toxic uh, to honeybees. Um, that we have to deal with. Those are natural toxins. And many plants have secondary metabolites that are also toxic to some level, including the almonds. Almonds have this toxic amygdalin in the nectar and pollen that bees have to deal with. And then uh, parasites uh, with uh, viruses, bacteria, European fabric, American fabric, those are all parasites on the honeybee, and notably the varroa mite and bee form wing virus. Those are the two major parasites that we're dealing with, dealing with nowadays. So here's my recipe for healthy hives. I will repeat this at the very end. And it's pretty simple. If you just simply uh, provide good nutrition, keep young queens and minimize your parasite levels, beekeeping is, is relatively easy. Most all your problems disappear. Minimizing the toxin load by avoiding both man-made toxins and natural plant toxins also helps. But maybe the main thing that separates successful beekeepers from less successful beekeepers Successful beekeepers are proactive in their management. They anticipate what the bees are going to need or what problems are going to be coming along rather than reacting to those problems after they already occur. This is a huge difference between successful and less successful beekeepers. <clears throat> so I do have a few suggestions. The first one is if you don't know any better, you're starting out, copy consistently successful local beekeepers. <clears throat> the question then is, how do you tell a consistently successful beekeeper? That's not necessarily the beekeeper that makes the newspapers, not necessarily the president of your local association. The most successful beekeepers have a, a problem every single year, and that is they have too many bees in the springtime and their colonies are gonna swarm and they either need to split their colonies or sell colonies, or here in California, we shake excess bees off and sell them as, as packaged bees. Um, so the way to tell if a beekeeper is successful is they have very low winter loss rates and their main problem is having too many bees in the springtime. Those are the people who I would suggest uh, using as mentors. The second thing is honeybees are a pretty amazing animal, but they're just simply animals. They're animal husbandry. You're keeping a livestock here. And yes, this is a, a free foraging livestock, but they're as animal care as you would use for, use for any other uh, animal. I have a background in the fisheries uh, uh, biology and found out that was useful. And I ran a farm store for a few years and that was all that knowledge all applies to the honeybees. <clears throat> Number three is all your management decisions should be based not upon what somebody tells you to do, but by understanding the biological needs of the colony at that time, which is what the most of this presentation will be uh, about. And thinking about how you learn to read the combs to tell you what the colony needs rather than asking somebody else to tell you what to do. 
So first thing you understand colony population dynamics. And there's two things that are happening, recruitment and attrition. Uh, recruitment is uh, the rearing of new worker bees. There's a very rapid turnover of worker bees uh, in the colony while there's brood rearing going on. The turnover is much slower when there's no brood rearing going on. But when there's brood rearing going on, very rapid turnover. About once a, once a month, uh, most of the population uh, turns over. Um, the bees don't live very, very long. And the way that bees deal with most problems is they simply rear more workers to take the place of the pollen workers. So as long as they can do that, the colonies typically do pretty well. The flip side is the attrition, the bees that fly off to die. A honeybee will very rarely die within the hive unless it's starved to death <clears throat> or constrained by very, very cold weather. Most of the time, any bee that's feeling as though it's at the end of its lifespan will fly out of the hive and die outside of the hive. <clears throat> and the extreme example of this here in the United States is when we saw this sudden colony collapse disorder, or if you allow Varroa and deforming virus to get too high in your hive. And what you'll see is a strong hive one week and two weeks later, there won't be a single bee in the hive. You won't see any dead bees. And that's typical of a deforming virus uh, kill. And then you can calculate out the net change in bees in the population, this being the population of the hive in the thousands, this being the uh, Northern Hemisphere dates right here. And I've calculated out, you have a growth curve like this, which would be typical for a strong colony, the net change every day in net population of workers in that hive. And during this build-up period, you're adding anywhere from five to 600, sometimes 700 workers per day net gain. And then the colony uh, recruitment comes into equilibrium with colony attrition and the colony stops growing. That's typically at about 40 times the queen's egg laying rate. So the more queen, eggs the queen can lay a, a day, the higher your resulting colony population equilibrium. And then the, the, uh, after the main flow, typically the, the queen cuts back on egg laying and attrition brings that uh, uh, population down slowly, more slowly than the, than the build up. So if you're doing management decisions, all your management decisions fall into one of two categories. One is to maximize recruitment, or the other is to minimize attrition. So understand why you're, you're doing things in the hive. Other thing to realize is that colony populations are, they follow pollen availability. To recruit new bees, the colony needs pollen. It needs uh, protein and, and uh, mineral and vitamin source. And I tracked over two years to show in my area, the pollen flows that we have and how the colony population follow, follows that. The, the reality is, is dates ha have nothing to do with it. If we go to Southern California, our springtime or their springtime starts in the month of November and their winter starts in late June. And the reason is, is that that's when the pollen, when it rains starting in November, plants produce pollen. So the colonies build up on that early pollen flow they make most of their honey maybe in March of the year, and then it dries up in June, and by July, they're in a winter condition. So it has nothing to do with day length um, or date of the year. It simply follows the pollen. And there's four phases for this new social insect every season. The first phase is the buildup phase, when food becomes available, followed by the reproduction phase, where they very rapidly grow the, the colony uh, growth right here. And at this point, um, uh, they uh, both may split off and um, uh, swarm to reproduce because colony reproduction is at the swarm level, not the individual bee level. And then there's the food storage uh, phase. Very, very important for uh, the honeybee in order to get through the, uh, the winter. And um, after the food storage, you have this dearth or survival phase, which is during the summer dearth, if you have one, and during the winter when it's too cold, when there's no plants flowering, and the bees just wait it out until the buildup phase then. <clears throat> now, wherever you live, I would suggest your local club create a chart like this, based not upon the calendar dates, but based upon what plants are blooming at certain times, put in when swarming season happens, and then you can back calculate the number of days um, uh, from these points. So you know, if you're gonna build your colony up for the main honey flow, you know how many days you have to build them up for that and how many days past swarm period 
your main honey flow starts. And use these numbers right here then to plan your colony management strategy. So this is one that I, I made for our local club that uh, shows uh, our beginning beekeepers when we typically store honey, uh, what you have to worry about at different times of the year. And this, this is on my first year beekeeping page at my website, which you're welcome to read. Now, I understand that beekeeping in Ireland is very, I've, I've been to Ireland, I've visited beekeepers in Ireland, and I understand that beekeeping is very different in Ireland than it is in California. So I'm not gonna give you any specific uh, advice. I, I don't give anybody any advice actually um, as to how to manage your colonies, but I suggest that each club make up a, uh, something like this, a chart like this to help out the beginners. The other thing is, and before Varroa, this was my uniform recommendation to beekeepers, don't open a hive at all unless you have a reason and understand what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be, why you're opening the hive, what you're going to be looking for when you open the hive, and what you're going to do if when you see something in the hive. Have your plan all figured out before you do anything. Otherwise, you're just bothering the bees. They're better off without you. Now, and back in the day, honeybees were often better off without any, any uh, inspection from the beekeeper. Nowadays, with Varroa, that's uh, no longer the case. Okay, so let's take a look at, at uh, how to understand the biology of the hive by reading the combs. <clears throat> First, understand the age structure over the course of the year. And I'm going to let you go to my website and you can see this graph that I, I created to show the uh, population structure with the youngest workers, 0 to 12 days here, the uh, 13 to 24 days. Most of them um, uh, will die uh, before they reach 50 days of age until the winter time when you start getting these very old workers, which may live up to two, 300 days uh, before they finally uh, die. And I can divide this into all these different uh, biological uh, uh, progressions inside, inside the hive, each one of these different. And I have a series of about 14 articles on my website. You can go into more deeply to understand what's happening biologically at each of these time periods uh, during the year. <clears throat> so when you're reading the combs, this is what you're gonna be looking for. You're looking for the honey, stored honey. This is older stored honey. The airspace has been lost, so the cappings are sticking down to the honey, so it makes it look darker right here. So you can tell this is not freshly gathered honey. Then bee bread, the fermented bee bread, gets this shiny appearance uh, right here. And then the fresh pollen. Now the fresh pollen is what the bees, the nurse bees prefer to eat. They prefer the fresh pollen as opposed to bee bread. Uh, but bee bread is the uh, anything excess pollen that's stored. Then you have the nurse bees in this area right here who are feeding the open brood, the larvae. And then this is what we call varroa food right here. So if you, um, uh, you, you, all, every beekeeper is also a varroa beekeeper, a varroa keeper. And some actually turn out to be more successful at growing varroa than they do at growing honeybees. And uh, then the bees suffer uh, for that. But anytime you see seal brood, think of it as varroa food. The other misconception that many people think is that the queen calls the shots in the colony. And that's, that's far from the truth. It's the nurse bees that run the show because the nurse bees control the food supply. They're the only bees in the hive that have the enzymes to digest pollen and get the nutrition out of it. They're the ones who decide whether they're going to, after a queen lays an egg, whether they're going to feed the larva or whether they're gonna cannibalize the egg or cannibalize any of the larvae. So it's the nurse bees that cause call almost all the shots in the hive and run the show. <clears throat> the question is, the nurse bees, they don't fly outside other than maybe a defecation flight. They're in pitch blackness right here. So this is, the, I, I, got a, I made a view of the nurse bees view of the world. They don't see a thing. It's completely black inside the hive. So the question is, how can they tell what's happening outside. So if you understand these cues that trigger the behavior of the nurses, one is how much honey stores there are in the hive, whether there's fresh nectar coming in, whether you have fresh pollen or pollen reserves in the hive, and how much larval pheromone there are from young larvae, which are saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. The place to look is at this interface between the capped honey, so this is fairly freshly capped honey, so see an airspace here, and the brood. This is the dynamic area where the interaction is happening in the hive. So when you do an inspection, 
this is the place that I look to see what's happening in the high. <clears throat> so this is this area has the energy stores for the colony, which are is capped honey, um, the bee bread, which is the protein reserve, and the brood, which is your energy and protein demand. Energy demand because they need a lot of sugar, plus they need to be heated up and kept warm, and then the protein demand, of course, coming from the uh, the, the pollen. Then you have two interfaces. You have this energy interface. This is this usually single line of cells between the sealed honey and the pollen band, which either will contain nectar, incoming nectar, or uncapped honey that the bees are consuming. So if the colony is uh, consuming its stores, it works its way up uncapping honey. If it's bringing in extra stores, it works its way down, filling these cells in with nectar, ripening it, and then capping it over. The other one is the protein interface, and that is this turnover of this incoming pollen, pollen coming, pollen coming in every day. Now in the springtime, there may be no reserves at all. They may be living hand to mouth, eating every bit of pollen as quickly as it comes in. And this puts the lie, the, uh, what I have heard on the internet, that the uh, uh, fermentation of pollen uh, into bee bread is necessary for bee nutrition. Well, that's patently uh, untrue because Many colonies can thrive without any fermented fermentation taking place of the pollen whatsoever if they're living hand to mouth. And if I take out samples of bees and crush them to look for nosema spores, you can see the difference between the nurse bees and the foragers, that the nurse bees have this cloudy orange cloudiness that's from the pollen in their guts, whereas foragers, they do not eat pollen and have very little in their guts and you wind up with a clear liquid. <clears throat> so the pollen, is then di digested by the nurses and they transform it into vitelligenin as a, a reserve. And then they use that to create jelly, uh, the components of the jelly, uh, two liquid components mix in their mouth parts and gel and you get what's called jelly. Some people call it royal, royal jelly, although I don't know there's much difference between royal jelly and, and uh, worker jelly. Um, the jelly then becomes a shared currency for all the bees in the hive so that every bee in the hive knows the nutritional status of that hive. When a forager returns from a foraging flight and needs, and needs a little bit of protein, it doesn't eat pollen. It goes to beg some jelly from a nurse bee. And at times that that's a significant load on the nurse bees, just giving jelly to the foragers. So the foragers get immediate feedback. The nurse bee says, oh, dude, I'm sorry. We're kind of uh, short on jelly right now. Then the foragers know that the colony needs pollen as opposed to nectar. And the queen knows, oh, maybe I better not be laying so many eggs. So there's a this constant feedback loop via the jelly. <clears throat> so let's take a look at colony buildup right now. We'll start here and we'll go through the season. <clears throat> so the first tree pollens come in spring. It's uh, alder trees in my area. I'm not sure what it is over in, in Ireland, but any beekeeper will should be able to tell you what the first pollens that come in would be. And this graph was from Manitoba, Canada, a cold winter area. And you can see right here where the first tree pollens come in, where this dotted line is the amount of brood in the hive and bingo, they start rearing brood right here. Here's a picture from one of my hives early uh, in the uh, late winter. Um, lots of this alder pollen here and they're just ramping up, just starting brood rearing. So they've been rearing brood for about um, uh, two weeks right here. They have some sealed brood and a little bit of fresh nectar right here. And this incoming pollen stimulates um, the nurses to produce jelly and start feeding the larvae, the jelly right here. So if the nurses see lots of pollen coming in, that means, hey, we can grow the colony. We'll start producing jelly. And then the young larvae put out a chemical called E-beta-osamine. And that E-beta-osamine is a pheromone which tells the Nurses, hey, I'm hungry, but it also tells the whole rest of the colony that they've got a laying queen. So when we get to swarming season, when, when you have a, maybe a disruption of this uh, larval pheromone due to the colony getting plugged out, every bee in the hive realizes, oh, something's wrong. We don't have a, a queen laying. That means either that we've plugged out the brood nest or it's time to uh, rear a new queen because the, the queen failed. So this E beta osamine is a very important pheromone which also changes the behavior of the foragers and causes the foragers, if they smell a lot of E-beta-osamine, to forage preferentially for pollen to feed them. Then we get to the spring turnover. And this was 
uh, illustrated by Al Avatabo some years ago, that in the early spring, your adult population starts going down, but your amount of brood to be fed starts going up. Well, this is a, a problem right here, and we call this the spring turnover here. So here's the plot of the amount of brood in the hive, and here's the plot of the amount of workers, these older bees. As soon as these long-lived nurse bees, or uh, uh, the diatinus or winter bees, start rearing brood, they shift to uh, nurse bee physiology, and then they go through the progression from nurse to mid-age to forager, and they die off very quickly. So they got about 35 days of life, life left, um, no matter how long they lived over the winter. Once they start rearing brood, they have a very short expected longevity. At the meantime, they're rearing up brood. So look right here. This is the total population of workers in the hive right here. Here's the total population of brood. You can have two to maybe three times as much <coughs> bees in the hive as brood in the cells as you do in workers, adult workers, to care for them. The trick for the spring turnover is you've got to get this big bounce of workers emerging to take the place of these winter bees before they all die off. So colony losses typically do not occur during the winter, um, unless it's due to a deforming virus. They occur during the early spring, uh, during bad weather, when the colonies are building up rapidly and they have an unsuccessful spring turnover. This also happens for us in, in California, where we have these massive groves, uh, a million acres of almonds coming in at the same time. And if these colonies do, have, do not have an established brood nest with a lot of uh, sealed uh, brood in there, and they begin this heavy foraging, they very rapidly wear themselves out and die. And these colonies collapse right in abundance because they have not successfully completed their spring turnover. <clears throat> and bees go all in on this. This is a colony in January that I graded at only two frames of strength, only two Langstroth frames covered with bees. And yet they have this big, beautiful, uh, brood, uh, brood patch right here. So they're in a race against time that these guys have to live long enough to keep these guys warm uh, so these guys can emerge and take the place of these ones that are going to die. And this is where we get parasite problems. And there's a seasonality to bee diseases that um, American foul brood can occur pretty much any time, but mainly during the, the summer. Uh, chalk root and European foul brood are mainly springtime diseases, although some strains of E. B. Uh, hang around longer. Varroa deforming virus we start seeing in uh, midsummer on into winter, and then the paralytic viruses and nosema uh, are during uh, cool weather, and especially with nosema during when the pollen flow starts, that the nosema, the pollen spike will uh, get nosema levels up, which usually is not that big of a deal in the colony. Nozema, though, this is a picture of uh, 400X. This is a, a bee trachea. This is uh, some bee gut tissue. You can see the striations of the muscles here. And every one of these little uh, white ovals is a nozema spore. It shows how, how abundant nozema is in the gut tissue of the bees. And they do make a nutritional stress upon the uh, bees. <clears throat> and the problem is, this is a colony right here. This is in February, uh, prior to almonds big, beautiful pattern of brood. But if you take one glance at this, you can say, oh my God, that colony is on the verge of collapse because this is February, it's cold conditions, we get frost at night. That many adult bees could never have thermoregulated that amount of brood, which is telling me that this colony is, the, the spring turnover is, is very iffy, that <clears throat> the adult bee population is dying more rapidly than it is emerging from the brood. And if we get a couple of chilly nights right here, you may see this in a couple of days where that cluster of remaining bees had to contract down to keep um, themselves warm, abandon the brood out here. You can see the band of pollen right here. So you can see this brood nest a couple of days ago filled this entire area. All this brood got chilled and died. Then the bees, when they warm up the next day, will pull that out and you wind up looking like this. So this is a, a death from nosema disease in the early spring. Another typical sign looks like this, where you see the ring where there was brood, and you, you have a, a queen and a handful of bees left left here. We saw a lot of this with uh, during the uh, invasion of Nozema serrani in the United States. We don't see very much of this any, anymore. The bees have uh, have adapted to Nozema serrani. A common misconception is with dysentery that dysentery 
is a sign of Nozema. Well, Nozema, there's no evidence that, that Nozema causes dysentery and lots of evidence that it does not cause dysentery. What it uh, does though, is if the bees do have dysentery due to a water balance problem, having too much water in their, in their guts and need to fly out and defecate, um, that this, if this defecation happens within the hive, it will spread any Nozema spores and can cause Nozema to become a problem in the hive. So in general, there's nothing you can do about <coughs> dysentery other than water management in the hive, making sure that they um, have uh, stores that don't have too much liquid uh, to digest. The only way you can diagnose Nozema is by microscopy. 400 times magnification, here's a, a bee hair, here's a, uh, a pollen grain, another pollen grain, and these are the Nozema spores right here. So without, without a microscope, you cannot diagnose Nozema, just uh, no matter what anybody says. And here's the thing, this is a Nozema serrani here, and, and there's not much effect on a, on a well-nourished colony. The bees just, just out, out produce it. But I find in my colonies, the prevalence, uh, if you have more than about two bees out of 10 uh, in, infested or infected with Nozema, you do have a colony, so it can slow down. When you get over about six or seven bees out of 10 in a colony in, infected, then your colony can actually have serious problems. But most of the time, I see very a very low proportion of bees in a colony infected with Nozema. If I take a sample of the bees from inside the hive rather than the foragers, the foragers will be will often be highly infected, but that doesn't seem to, does not seem to hurt the hive much. <clears throat> okay, so if the bees get past the spring turnover, they go into the linear linear growth phase, and they grow quickly when pollen is abundant. Here's some old data from Nolan from 1925 where he grew package bees. Bees where you buy two or three pounds of bees in a, in a box for the queen, put them on combs and let them grow. And you can see this growth rate is just, just linear until it reaches, tops out at when they get to be, be about 40 times the uh, 400, I'm sorry, 40 times the egg laying rate of the queen and then it tops back out there. So typically that's for about two months, this linear growth. <coughs> And you see this, this linear growth uh, right here. Now, these colonies, when they're growing very quickly, they can be living hand to mouth. So this is uh, where we went out and, and we're supering up a bunch of singles that were overflowing with bees. And we're putting the second brood chamber on. Now, here in California, we typically use two brood chambers, Langtroth brood chambers, one over the other, so we can grow a large clusters of, of bees. And then we put honey supers on above those brood chambers. So this colony is looking great. But boy, if it rains for a couple of days, there's a problem because there's this big turnover of, <coughs> of bees. <coughs> Roughly once a month, the population of bees turns over. And this requires a pound or two every single week of pollen coming in to maintain the replacement of these bees. And this is typical of how a colony looks at that time of year. You may have fresh nectar coming in and very, very little reserves of pollen. They're eating the pollen as fast as they're bringing in, even though there's a big old brood nest, just enough, but there's no excess right here. So they're living hand to mouth. Then when I when I looked at this data from uh, Lloyd Harris in Manitoba, I saw this dip in the brood right here. I checked the weather history and found out, oh yeah, this was when a cold uh, rainstorm moved into Manitoba, Canada, and they cut back on brood rearing right here. So this would be a hiccup due to rain. When it does rain, within, within an hour, the nurse bees shift their feeding of the larvae. They cut back, they start conserving that uh, jelly. And this is work done by Dr. Carl Krelshan that, that demonstrated this when he put sprinklers on top of, of hives. <clears throat> within about two or three days, typically, the column goes into protein deficit and, uh, and things get bad. <clears throat> Here's a, a picture of a, of a colony. After four days of rain in the springtime, this colony looked just like that picture uh, three or four pictures back, this, this wall to wall bees, where they've consumed all their honey stores, all their bee bread stores, and then they consume, start, first consume the eggs, then the larvae, young larvae, and the older larvae, leaving only just the uh, sealed brood uh, to try to um, emerge to take these guys' place. So, this is survival mode, and this is typical just prior to colony total starvation when they uh, consume the brood, this cannibalism. Now, a colony can recover from this, but 
the ones that do uh, typically don't make any honey crop that year. And you may not notice this at all. Many beekeepers, if you're not in the habit of when your hive's up, when it's out there raining, you're never going to see this happen. You, you won't realize what happened to your colonies because many beekeepers don't put on rain gear and work in the rain, contrary to us. So these are my two sons right here, and they grew up with me treating my bees better than I treat my own family members. Um, that we're, if it's raining in the springtime, we're out there feeding pollen sub to our bees to make sure that they maintain colony, colony health for us. And somebody said, Randy, you guys are out feeding your bees when it's raining and snowing and stuff? I said, well, duh. When it's warm and sunny, they feed themselves. When it's raining and snowing, then they can't. And that's when you become a beekeeper. You take care of your bees and you serve your bees. So this is what we do. Springtime in California, we often will dress this way for a month or more straight, keeping bees every single day. Uh, this is standard attire just because it's raining all the time. <clears throat> you can also use the uh, artificial nectar, sugar syrup, to stimulate the buildup of the hives. Okay, hive inspection. Typically, from a commercial beekeeper standpoint, man, a 30-second hive inspection is often all you need to do, maybe even less time than that. We pop the lid, we pull a frame like this out of the center of the brood nest, we take a look at the survival rate of the brood. We look for reserves. We look for honey um, stores, any side of disease, and bingo, in and out, and it's done. So we do very quick hive inspections. <clears throat> Healthy brood, high larval survival rate, pretty solid pattern right here. Spotted brood, you got a problem. It's either early in the season, it may be a disease problem. This would look like uh, maybe European fowl brood early in the season. Or later in the season, you have a problem with uh, protein here, maybe imbalanced protein or lack of protein, and there's cannibalism, take, cannibalism taking place. And then much later, this could be a sign of maybe deformed wing virus or something happening that you would see uh, dead and dying uh, larvae and pupae, if it were. <clears throat> Uneven age, look at your brood. Notice how you have very young larvae sitting next to older larvae. That means that these larvae are dying and the queen's coming back and filling the, the the holes back in. You want to see a uniform pattern of larvae all the same age next to each other. So this indicates there's a problem, either poor nutrition or disease in the, in the hive. Chalk brood, very distinctive look. They have this dark uh, oval and then the, the white hard mummy. Um, and I don't know any uh, cure for chalk brood, any treatment that actually uh, works. Uh, typically it goes away on its own. And if not, we suggest just requeening the colony, getting a new genetics in there. European uh, fowl brood. This has been a big issue worldwide lately. We never used to worry about it. They would just, we'd see it in the springtime, but once the natural nectar and pollen flow came in, it would just go away and, and we wouldn't have to worry about it at all. Nowadays, it, it, some of the strains of European fowl brood don't tend to go away. Uh, we have a tool here in the United States that um, you guys may not have available. That's oxytetracycline antibiotic. And um, we do not use it in our operation prophylactically, but if we do see European fowl brood, we will spot treat colonies and it works really great. It goes away and we don't see it recur at all. We, um, um, last several years, we've seen almost no uh, European fowl brood in our colonies. And uh, I don't know if I have a slide for um, American fowl brood. That used to be a big problem for us. We haven't seen a case of American fowl brood in our colonies in quite a few years now, and we don't use antibiotics uh, for it. We uh, instituted a, a zero tolerance policy for American fowl brood years ago. Uh, even one cell in a colony and the whole, whole uh, all the combs get burned and the box is sterilized. And we just eliminated it and we haven't had it coming back. Unfortunately, not, oh, four hours drive from us in the Bay Area of California where there's a bunch of uh, hobby treatment free beekeepers uh, American fowl brood is raging down there. So um, if you don't have good management, it can become a problem again. In general, if you see a mixture of different pollen co colors, just like getting a plate from, the, from a, a buffet, if you got a bunch of different colors on your plate, it's probably a healthier diet than one that has only one color. So this would be a good indication of good nutrition in the colony. 
The main thing we look at is the amount of jelly that are being fed around the larvae. Notice the bottom of the cell is pretty much covered right here, not completely. So this colony is getting an adequate, not an abundant amount of protein, but adequate. The nurses are, are pretty much giving the larvae as much as they want right there. This would be abundant nutrition where they actually cover the whole cell bottom wall to wall with jelly. Not, not the first instar larvae, but these second instar larvae. Uh, is, is the ones you want to look at right here. When the egg first hatches, they give them only a little bit of jelly. But by the time they've done their first molt, so day two as a larva, you, if you see wall-to-wall -wall jelly, you're going to be the best beekeeper in the world because your colony is going to be thriving no matter what you, what you do. Now, if you look at these larvae, notice that the workers are only giving them enough jelly just for their daily need right here. And the larvae corkscrew around the bottom, eating that up, going in little circles all day. So here's a colony that's under, um, under nutritional stress right here. And it's, they're just a sitting duck for any kind of uh, pathogen or parasite right uh, here. Another one, larvae swimming in jelly right here, looking really good. These guys, the colony like this can fight off almost anything other than uh, too high of a row uh, count. And another one here uh, taken where the eggs are here. But when the larvae hatch, they're getting just barely enough jelly just to keep them alive. So learn to read the jelly. That's the first thing we always look at. Okay, and then your billet phase brings them up until you start to peek out on your amount of brood in the hive. And at this point, when you have a colony full of sealed brood, is a time for them to swarm. <clears throat> Especially when you get backfilling with nectar and the Brood nest is bumping up against the honey reserves. There's no place for any more nectar to come in. The queen can no longer lay eggs then because the cells are getting filled up. After four days, there's no E beta osamine smell, and the whole colony realizes, oh my gosh, we filled the cavity. Time for us to reproduce. And they'll start rearing uh, drone cells. They already would have started with the uh, worker, or the uh, start rearing queen cells. They already would have started with the drone cells. And one of the things you can do, you can manipulate the brood nest. Now this, uh, in Ireland, you don't tend to stack them quite this high. In the Midwest of the United States, uh, they often stack uh, colonies quite high, but simply putting, um, moving the brood around so that there's uh, dark, empty combs immediately above the queen or adjacent to the brood nest will often cause the colonies to reverse the swarm impulse because the queen can start laying again and that E beta osamine uh, from the young larvae then reverses the swarming impulse. You get this far where you start seeing the queen cells being made at the bottom of the of the combs. It's too late. It's time to split your colony. <clears throat> this is us, my, me and my two sons. Uh, we create um, about 3,000 nucleus hives every spring. We, we sell quite a few of them, and then we clean our whole our, we start our whole operation from five frame nukes every single spring uh, with with young young queens. And we just set up an assembly line and blast out making these nukes. And if you don't do it in time, the colony reproduced, the bees are off the trees, and now you've created a varroa bomb out there. You not only have a competing colony out there, but this colony will likely not be able to manage varroa and flood the environment with more mites and virus uh, later on, uh, causing uh, problems in the late summer and fall. So we try to avoid our colonies swarming as much as we can so we don't have these varroa bombs sitting out there. Now, when the colony swarms, it typically leaves plenty of frames just chock full of sealed brood. And a, uh, a square inch of sealed brood emerges into three square inches of workers' uh, bees because the bees turn sideways now instead of being stacked like cordwood. So a very rapid expansion rate. So a single frame of sealed brood will, will in a few days, equal three frames covered with worker uh, bees. So when the swarm leaves, the colony behind can very rapidly rebound in this population. Builds back up, and then when the colony ideally reaches its peak population, right when the main honey flow starts. If they're too early, they might starve. If they're too uh, starve before they get there, if they're too late, they might starve over the winter. So they want to coordinate the timing. And this is what the beekeeper also wants to do. You want to build their peak colony population right at the beginning of the nectar flow. And the reason is, is that strong colonies are much more efficient at putting on honey than weak colonies are. You're better off with one strong colony 
than two wheat colonies as far as honey production. Unfortunately, they make more, uh, more can put on more honey. And then the honey flow begins. They start shaking nectar, and the whole colony shifts now to maximizing sugar storage for the winter. And again, they don't know about you. They don't know you want to make honey. They store honey for themselves. And this fresh nectar forces the brood nest downward. And the, the mid-age bees, which receive the nectar, are, are mad and looking for any place to store that uh, incoming nectar. <coughs> when they start to run short on room to store the nectar, they start building new comb. And what you see that as a beekeeper is white wax, which tells you that you need to do one of two things. Either your colony is going to swarm, or you need to give them some more space, or you're missing out on a honey crop right now. So when you see my, white wax in a hive, that means you're not doing your job as a beekeeper, that you're being reactive rather than proactive. And that's the time that we can draw a foundation um, directly above the brood chamber. We, our business model is mainly in drawing foundation. We, we start, we draw 5,000 frames of deep foundation every single year, okay? So we're, we're foundation drawing company. <clears throat> we draw all that foundation, 10 frames put side by side. We do not intersperse drawn with, with foundation and put it directly above the, uh, generally above a single brood chamber and the bees draw it very rapidly. One thing that inhibits that, uh, if you're putting on a queen excluder in a super above a foundation, if there's a honey band above the brood between that foundation and the, um, and the, and the brood, the bees are hesitant to draw the foundation. You want to make sure you have frames with no honey band directly below the foundation. And then there's these feedback loops in the hive. I'm not going to go over these. You can, you can read this uh, Schmickel and Karelsheim 2008 about how they get the division of labor. They need to maintain roughly one mid-age bee for every field bee in order to have enough bees for processing the incoming nectar. And then when the nectar flow is big, then brood rings be prioritized. And if you see here, this was the nectar flow began in Manitoba and look what happens to the amount of brood in the hive. The reason is the, is the mid-age bees then hijack the brood nest away from the queen and fill all the cells full of nectar so the queen cannot lay. The last thing the colony needs is a whole bunch of new bees emerging right here because there's just gonna be extra mouths to feed with, with no benefit to the colony. Um, so the colony, once the nectar flow starts, if it's going to be a short nectar flow, does not need to be rearing any more bees. So they deprioritize brood rearing. <clears throat> Here's a picture I took out in uh, the Midwest. This is uh, Tim Ives. Um, and this is how high he stacks his hives. They make these huge honey crops. He'll make a 350 pound honey crop out there. Now, <clears throat> this may be a surprise to uh, Europeans who seem to be very anti genetically engineered crops and anti-neonic uh, insecticides. But Tim is in a little tiny itty patch of these trees here. If you were to look beyond these trees, and I did, I drove it and I also Google mapped it. As far as you can see, it's nothing but GMO corn and soybeans with neonicotinoid treated seed. And he just laughs at all the hoopla against the anti-GM, genetically engineered crops and the hoopla against the neonicotinoid insecticides. He is very successful at making honey uh, on those crops. Okay, after the, the honey flow then, you get these dryness out here. This would be what it would look like out around you know, tins where <clears throat> there's no pollen coming in. The bees then go into survival mode. You have this pollen dearth typical in many areas, very much so here in California. And there's very little recruitment going on. So the colony population starts dropping down. <clears throat> Slowly drops them down right here. Now, it doesn't need as high a rate as here because the queen's not laying eggs here. So this attrition will reduce the population. And they, what the colony wants to do is eliminate all these extra mouths to feed. And when I've done the math on this, if, if they didn't have this drop in population, most colonies would starve before uh, or during the winter. And this now at this point, you're brood pattern is going to start looking different. You're going to start having the nurses following the queen cannibalizing the brood, and you wind up with these spotty patterns. The colony is healthy, they just the nurses are not rearing all the brood. 
And if you want to, as a beekeeper, you can rejuvenate that colony, rejuvenate the age structure by putting on protein. This is what we're doing right now with our colonies. We put on pollen substitute. <clears throat> I'm actually running a controlled trial now, testing out uh, eight different um, or seven pollen subs and then a control of just uh, sugar alone um, on 144 hives. So I'm trying to see how well the, today's pollen subs uh, available commercially in the United States compare one to the other. But we're big feeders of, of pollen, pollen sub at this time of year. And then our good friend, the varroa mite. <clears throat> There's a free download. If you just Google Randy's varroa model, this will pop up. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And you can and uh, input your colony type for the um, your colony population, adult population, your amount of sealed brood or varroa food, your percentage of that brood that will be infested by varroa, all based upon a mite wash count, which used to be alcohol wash for us, and now we use a Dawn detergent found works very, very well for the uh, mite washes. So you can adjust it to your mite wash count, count at any point, and then figure out a treatment strategy on how to manage for uh, varroa. And the thing to be realize is that your mite wash count increases much faster than your actual varroa population in the late season because your number of bees in the hive is decreasing as your varroa slowly increases. So you need to learn to interpret the alcohol wash uh, count. And in an unmanaged, in an un, um, untreated hive uh, with non-resistant bees, 100 mites can easily, you know, in a, at least in a, a season over here in the United States, increase to 10,000 mites in the hive and the colony will, will crash. <clears throat> okay, and here's what you start to see, signs of varroa buildup. You're gonna see some varroa sensitive uh, hygiene or uh, uncapping, recapping behavior. This is hygiene when they actually chew it out, uncapping, recapping, you just see the, the faces of the pupae. Right here, this is bald brood or uncapping, recapping behavior. In my selective breeding program, I'm seeing more and more of this. So I'm guessing it's, it's one of the major mechanisms for my bees resisting uh, varroa. <clears throat> you may see some bees with the signs of bee forming virus, but not necessarily. But you will see, you start to see the larvae and pupae dying from the uh, virus. And the reason is, is that we track down the mites per 100 bees in this red track right here, that the prevalence of highly infected workers exactly for both the bee forming virus and the uh, cashmere virus complex right here. Um, this track right along with the mite infestation mood. So it's the viruses that actually wind up killing your colony. And typically, once the this percentage of uh, infested pupae passes about 25% or so, um, your colony is going to be toast. The virus just, just takes over and, and kills the colony. <clears throat> You're going to start seeing this sign of a, uh, these bees being unable to emerge dying in the cells and eventually you get what's called we call parasitic mite syndrome with just ugliness of all these virus infected uh, uh, pupae and larvae uh, dying in the, the cells close up of uh, a virus uh, epidemic in the colony and finally we get this collapse where your telltale sign is the fecal deposits on the tops of the cells so i have beginning beekeepers every year say oh my god uh you know, pesticides killed my hives, or, or cell phone towers killed my hives, or jet chemtrails killed my hives. And let me see one of your combs. I go, you see all these, these white spots here? I said, varroa and deformed wing virus killed your hives. It wasn't any of those other things. It was your lack of mite control. There's another picture of the fecal deposits from the mites, the telltale sign you look for to see whether it was mites that were responsible. The problem is that when a colony gets a high mite level, there's a tremendous amount of drift of bees from hive to hive, and they often carry mites. Look at, see, here's a mite on this bee, here's a mite on that bee. So these high mite level hives, the workers are loaded with mites, and they move around, move the strains of viruses, <coughs> which are constantly evolving, plus these uh, infected bees, uh, plus these mites from hive to hive. <coughs> so if you think of every every hive that that is collapsing as spreading uh, um, these mites and viruses through the, through the environment. It's very similar with COVID right now. You want to stay away from people who are sneezing. Same thing, you want to stay away from beekeepers who are allowing bees, their hives, to die from lack of proper management. And for mite control, 
um, I've studied for many, many years. The number one uh, method for my control by beginning beekeepers is commonly called wishful thinking, and it's never, ever worked to control rural. In our operation, we, uh, we, we don't use synthetic miticides. We use uh, the organic uh, treatments, uh, oxalic acid, formic acid, and thymol. And this is our mite management and bee management strategy uh, laid, laid out on my uh, spreadsheet. And you can develop one of these for yourselves also on, on the spreadsheet. We're also involved in the selective breeding program. These are the ones we're looking for where the mite wash count in, in July was a zero, in August was a zero, in, in uh, September was a zero, and then November was a zero. And we, these colonies that can keep their mites down to almost nothing for an entire rear, these are the ones, only ones that we are uh, breeding our queens off of. We're only, we're still about 10% of our operation now is exhibiting resistance. We're, it's, a, it's a process and we're working on it. Okay, once the, if you have uh, autumn pollen flows, like you guys might be having with the ivy uh, right now, <clears throat> you get a bump up in the brood rearing. And this is critical for, this is where your colonies prefer it for winter. And they, they may store the bee bread below the brood nest for later time winter reserves. <clears throat> when we're feeding with pollen sub now, if we come back and the colony has not eaten their pollen sub, we just write that colony off. It's, it's got an issue. We know it's not gonna be worthwhile uh, spending time with. And finally, you get your first killing frost, no more pollen coming in, and you see brood rearing drops down to essentially nothing for a while here. <clears throat> the emerging bees at this time don't smell any e beta osamine, no larval pheromone. And that says, oh, our colony must be in survival mode. Instead of becoming a nurse bee, I'm going to become a long lived diatinus bee and go into that winter bee or diatinus physiology. <clears throat> Some excellent work from uh, Heather Mattel uh, exhibits how this, instead of the bees dying, this is your uh, proportion of surviving bees over time. These are the dates of the bees emerging from the sealed brood. And during the summer, they very, very quickly, uh, their population drops off and don't live long. And then come these last ones to emerge, they have a very uh, low mortality rate during the winter, but their mortality rate, once they start rearing brood right here, very quickly drops. That's that problem with that spring turnover again. <clears throat> Difference between a forager bee and a nurse bee, all these fat bodies, where the, the long-lived bees have lots of fat bodies, lots of intelligence, and so they, it extends their, their longevity. The other thing they do is in the fall, when I crush bees, normally you only get a small percentage of that pollen in your guts. Uh, this is a November uh, count right here, where you can see every single bee in the hive goes into the winter with their gut full of pollen. Then you have the fall turnover, where when I start off measuring the, the strength of colonies, these are uh, ones with 18 frames covered with bees, 17 down to 12 covered with bees, down to seven frames covered with bees. And I took the, um, <coughs> um, uh, so this is the, the strength at this time. And then I took a, a, a grading also in December and then in January. You can see these uh, largest colonies have a very big population loss of the um, older summer bees flying off to die. And then they uh, uh, winter with a lower strength. Typically uh, here in California, around that eight to frame, frame strength, what every one of them uh, winters that. The thing that we saw, the dinks, the ones that are too weak to take to almond pollination, the smaller the, the strength in October, the greater proportion of those colonies that are not going to make it to uh, uh, strength in the spring. So they had a problem, obviously, back then that they were not able to get rid of. But those that don't fail, they build right back up again. You can see right here, they, they uh, increase their, their strength. So all these, uh, as those summer bees fly off to die, these bees shift to this long-lived uh, physiology and they form the winter cluster where they have this uh, insulating uh, shell of bees around the outside and they maintain a tropical environment on the in inside. <clears throat> and they may from time to time rear some brood, possibly for moisture balancing here. You can see on this, if you open up the hive during the winter, um, they'd be in this tight cluster. But if you give a puff of smoke, in just a few seconds, you see 
There are very few beads in the center. There's this tight insulating shell that actually keeps the, 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 um, the heat inside the column. And that's where you can see on these uh, with the snow here, where this heat loss happens at the top. So it points out the importance of keeping some top insulation over your hive if you have a cold winter environment. Now let's look at the attrition rate of these bees, almost level until they initiate brood rearing. So almost no mortality of those winter bees until they start rearing uh, brood. Uh, very little uh, protein reserve. They use up whatever body reserves in the bee bread to raise those first rounds of brood right here. And then uh, maybe in the middle of uh, winter, uh, they get some brood rearing. And you can see, see this right here uh, in his uh, in Lloyd's graph. The bees in the, even in the shed winter in Canada, no access to sunlight, no access to temperature change. They will initiate brood rearing, perhaps to for water balance to uh, rid themselves of the uh, excess water in their guts. And we can also stimulate winter bee laying. I have friends that do this in preparation for almond, almond pollination. Uh, Keith Jarrett uh, builds these giant colonies over the winter. And uh, so this is in, uh, in January, January 22nd. While other beekeepers are desperate to get their colonies strength up, Keith actually goes out and shakes bees off these combs into bulk bee packages and sells bulk bees to other beekeepers to boost their colony strength for their almond contracts. He does this, does this all on supplemental feeding of pollen substitute. And we get to the first pollens coming in, and then the first tree pollens, and we are back to the beginning. The cycle becomes again, starts again, and that's the end of this presentation. And let's see, I'm gonna put my video back on. Brandon. Yeah, so thank you, Randy. That was really interesting and entertaining. Um, there are a few questions. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Daniel asked, uh, I thought it was nectar shared through, uh, share through tro trophallaxis, not jelly. Is, both, is both, of them, both, both of them are shared through trophallaxis. Okay, so this is yeah, that, and the reason is is that bee, honeybees have not figured out how to use plates and bowls and spoons and forks. So the only way to share food is through trophallaxis. True. Um, no, I think really the question is about is is this a uh, is troph is is this the same as royal jelly, or is this uh, brute food of some kind or what? I'm not sure that there's really that much difference. There's okay. two components to jelly. But um, the queens are fed a little higher proportion of sugar and a, a little uh, uh, more of one of the uh, components from the mandibular or the hypopharyngeal glands. Um, but it's, it's not apparently a, a huge thing. It's mainly just volume of food and amount of sugar that differentiates a worker uh, or should differentiate a fertile uh, larva, a, a female larva, into a worker. The queen is the default. A starved larva turns into a worker. The queen is the default. That's normal. A, 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 a fertile female, a reproductive female, is normal in on this planet. Okay. Um, next question. What's the best way to artificially feed and increase the worker bee population in a hive to prepare for the honey flow? Well, you, you count it backwards. It, it, you want to do um, <clears throat> about, um, depending how large the colony is, it takes, takes anywhere from six to 10 weeks, depending on your colony size, to build the colony up for the honey flow. So you've got to figure out, with experience, you'll figure out you know, from size how long you, have, you need to do that, do that for, and also to keep them from swarming. If you start too early, they're going to swarm before you do it. So it's a timing thing to avoid swarming, that striking that balance, and, and to build them up. It also depends upon what, what kind of choices do you guys have for a substitute over there? Do you have much choices? I don't know if there's anything commercially available. I think it's, uh, you know, it's just whatever people mix up. Um, generally, we don't have a problem with pollen shortages since we yeah. have gorse in winter, and that goes yes. into into willow and hazel and alder. Yeah. yeah. So if you have that, you probably don't need to do a thing. And again, look at the jelly. The jelly will tell you whether there's a shortage. If there's if the if there's plenty of jelly around the workers. With a, the last thing we want to do is waste money on feeding bees. That's, <laughs> that, it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. 
That's the last thing we want to do. So we feed them if the colony, the combs indicate that they need feeding. So we look at the amount of jelly. Okay, so somebody says here you can get a Ultra B and B Pro from the- Okay, yeah. If you can get, get those, 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 those would work. Ultra B is, is a, a little higher quality than the, the B Pro and uh, work, work great. But again, don't do anything blindly. Open your hive up, look at the amount of jelly around the larvae. That will tell you whether they have a, a, a short on nutrition. Okay, looking forward to see the results of your, your, your comparisons though. Oh yeah. Um, another one is, uh, um, you say that you don't want a band of honey between the brood nest and queen excluder. What do you do if you have this band of honey to encourage the bees into the super? Uh, go look for some uh, drawn comb, especially a dark drawn comb, and uh, drop that right into the middle of the brood nest uh, so that, there's, that creates a pathway for the bees to go right up uh, up above. Um, so it's a matter of moving things around. If In the United States, many beekeepers use double brood chambers. So one on top of the other, you can just flip your brood chambers or just move a few combs. But essentially you want a open comb all the way up to the queen excluder for at least one one frame. Okay. Um, what's your view on Amitraz as a varroa treatment? Is there any evidence of resistance emerging? Also any- Oh yeah. Yeah, here in the United States, there's, there's yes, uh, Dr. Frank Rinkovich from the USDA just finished uh, some really good uh, uh, survey of that. And yes, there are clearly Amitraz resistant mites developing in the United States. Um, I went through the first first two phases of synthetic mitocides through, through the fluvalinate, did a year with the uh, Kumafos, uh, which was just scary stuff to use. And I said, man, this is not why I became a, a beekeeper. So I've, we've never used Amitraz in our operation other than experiment, when we're running an experiment where we're, we're, we're testing it, uh, Amitraz for some reason or other. But other than that, our operation, we, we just gave up on the synthetic mitocides altogether. Now, that said, I got nothing against them other than <clears throat> we get a premium for our honey by not having mitocides uh, in it. <clears throat> if that's making a difference to you on, on residues, then the Amtras is very generally very effective and the Apovar strips are, are effective um, and widely used um, by beekeepers. But eventually, yes, we're gonna see more and more resistance to Amitraz. Yeah, and another thing I, I, they asked is uh, any tips on using formic acid as Max seems like a very harsh treatment. I think this really refers to the fact that the national hive is different to the Langstroth and the Langstroth is where they tested the Max. Uh -huh. So the, there's now a new form out by the same company. And I, I, I've known the, the developer, David Vanderbusen, for many years on these products. I'm, I've gone through each iteration and, and sometimes I actually test preliminary uh, products for him. <clears throat> He's got a new formula, formulation out called uh, Formic Pro. It has sawdust mixed in with the matrix. <coughs> what it does, it doesn't have quite as an intense release in the first few hours when you put it into the hive. And it's also much more user-friendly to use than the the max as far as getting exposed to it. So we like it from, because when we apply it, we're applying it, you know, thousands of strips at a time. Um, so I, I, I just ran a trial of the um, Formic Pro and was very uh, happy with it. Uh, interestingly, I applied it under the absolute worst conditions, which means on weak colonies, every one of them with a second year queen intentionally in hot, hot weather, far hotter than the recommended temperature to see what would happen. And in the treatment where you put on one strip and then you wait 10 days and put on the second strip, our queenless rate at the end of the trial was no higher than, it's actually lower than the control group, that of the control group. So um, now I'm not saying that some queens were not lost, but the colonies just simply requeened themselves. So when I checked back, I could see that a lot of them just had fresh eggs, uh, had not um, had had a break, but the overall queen loss rate was quite low. Um, we, we use it all the time in our colonies and uh, just don't have a problem. Now there's, there's many tricks for using it. Okay, so you know where you place it, um, if you want, uh, you can restrict the amount of surface area exposed put a little piece of plastic or something over the top of the strip. And then the, the bottom of the strip has very little exposure 
for the vaporization. You got three eighths inch space and then an inch and three eighths of wood. So when we're treating nukes, you can put a whole strip on a, a three frame nuke in hot weather. And you put the lid down tight to the top of the formic strip because that stops any evaporation from there. You could do the same thing in your hive. If you think it's too strong, just cover, cover the top of the strip with a piece of plastic and that will slow down the release rate. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, where, where are we? Oh, yeah. So, how do you uh, uh, know if you have queen cells if you only check one frame for 30 seconds or less? Is it because you well? Oh, we, because we use double brood chambers. So, most all the queen cells are, are built between the two brood chambers. <clears throat> we also have a, a, a good idea. You got to realize when you're a large scale beekeeper, you don't have to look in every hive. You get an idea from a few hives, <clears throat> and we we pretty much know that if we crack the lid and there's and it's uh, the month of March or April and there's bees wall to wall across the top, that they're going to be making queen cells. So we we're proactive that way based upon just the uh, assessing the strength of the hive from the top. But we if we split the boxes, the queen cells are obvious because they hang from the uh, bottom of the upper brood chamber. Okay. Um, let's see. Does uh, using pollen substitutes have uh, an effect on the quality of the queens raised from it? Well, we don't raise queens on pollen substitute. We raise queens on frames of natural pollen. So when we, what we do is we collect from our operation as we're splitting those hives. There's there's frames just full of fresh bee bread. We bring those to the queen rearing area and rear all of our queens on natural pollen. So I, I can't I couldn't answer that question. Okay. I know other beekeepers who do um, use pollen sub and their queens seem to be fine. What we're seeing is that the better tier of pollen substitutes are damn near as nutritious as natural pollen. Okay, that's interesting. Um, let's see, is there anything else here? Um, 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 um. Uh, just a comment saying that uh, found that flipping brood chambers delays swarming and often prevents swarming as well as encouraging bees into the supers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all the questions. All right. Great. So thank you very much. Really got you. And uh, I think everybody uh, from the comments, everybody enjoyed it. So thank. Oh, you. great. Well, good luck with you guys with your uh, your bees. And um, we're I'll be heading out to a yard today. Actually, that pollen sub trial. I need to. Um, I'm going to use actually formic acid treatment on them to get the mites back on, on them. So I got a whole bunch of formic acid to apply. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Randy. And you betcha. Take care. Everybody for attending. All right. Bye -bye.